So good morning, everyone. Um, so my name is Danny Vol. Uh, I just moved to Astron in the Netherlands, and I'm also uh, affiliated with the Netherlands E uh, Science Center. But uh, previously, I was at Swinburne in Australia, working uh, with a group called ADAX, so Astronomy Data and Computing Services. And so work that I'm going to present today is mostly work I've done uh, while my, uh, I was spending time at uh, Swinburne. Um, and so uh, I kind of wanted to talk about uh, issues of uh, the volume and velocity of data in astronomy nowadays, and ways to sort of go around that. Um, so as you're all very well aware, I'm, I'm pretty sure, um, astronomy is a data-driven science, and we have to deal with issues of big data. Uh, big data is sort of a, an umbrella for a lot of things, so one way to actually uh, talk about it is via the three Vs of big data, uh, volume, velocity, and variety. The volume is basically just the sheer volume of data that we need to deal with. It can be either uh, working with lots of files or big files or a mix of both. And uh, the problems comes when we need to actually store this data, uh, access it or transfer it. Um, and if you have a lot of data, it can become a bit of a problem. The velocity is the speed at which this data is either being created, deleted, or accessed or transferred. Uh, this has some impacts when you do things like time domain astronomy. Um, and so this uh, has quite a bit of an impact on uh, specific communities. And then variety in general in astronomy is not as much as a problem. Uh, we usually have to deal with only a few data formats like FITS or HDF5 and so on. Um, and so we can sort of forget it. Um, but the other two have a, a serious impact and we actually need to address them if we want to continue on working on big projects. Um, volume and velocity have some effects on both sort of the more practical parts, uh, like storage and transfer, uh, and also a bit more of the philosophical part for visualization and analysis of data. So how do you make sense of large collections of data? Uh, as you're all aware from the two previous days, there are a lot of uh, work being done on automated pipelines to use machine learning to solve some issues, uh, but that's only one part of the problem. Uh, and then for other surveys, uh, so we're upgrading telescopes uh, with new instruments and new uh, supercomputers to make broad surveys of the sky. So for example, the uh, Wester Borg telescope was upgraded with a new receiver, or new receivers, I should say, um, <coughs> which will allow to look at a wider field of view, but also comes with the impact of having to deal with lots and lots of data. So for example, Spectral cubes from in, uh, coming from Aperitif will be a quarter of a terabyte per file. So this is way too big for just a laptop to look at, usually. And uh, other similar surveys, like the Wallaby uh, using the ASCAP, uh, ASCAP telescope in Australia, will have a terabyte file uh, cubed. So uh, these are huge. But this is only part of the problem again. So we're going to store a lot of data as well. Uh, for Aperitif, the survey is expected to uh, collect about 20,000 spectral cubes throughout the course of the survey. And each cube is expected to have about 100 sources per cube. And so how do you start dealing with this? Uh, obviously, you need automated pipeline, but also uh, the human kind of needs to be in the loop to make sense of all the data. And so there are challenges there. For time domain astronomy, as I was saying, you have issues of access of data and storage. Uh, often you need to do that very quickly, but computing uh, facilities on observatories are not always designed to just do uh, the post-processing. Often, most of the computation will be uh, there to do um, more the data collection. And so if you want to do post-processing and finding transients very quickly, uh, often, uh, since you're not living next door to the telescope, you're going to have to transfer this data to a remote lo location. And uh, how do you do that quickly if you're uh, dealing with loads and loads of data? And so I'll start a bit with the spectral cubes, and then I'll come back later to the other one. Um, Chris Fluke came up with this kind of idea where uh, there should be some kind of balance between the human input and the machine. Um, obviously, as I was saying, we don't want to look at 20,000 spectral cubes times 100 sources by eye. This will be very impractical. Um, but we also don't want to leave everything to the machine learning algorithm uh, because it might miss interesting things that we might uh, be interested in. And so there's this kind of like fine tuning that we need to do to maximize our science. Uh, and we can expect that uh, we're going to still be in the loop uh, in, for the discovery uh, to a certain extent. You know, once your algorithm has spit, spat out some kind of results, you need to make sense of it anyways. You might want to write some papers, uh, so 
we can expect that we're still going to be in there. Um, so some ways to actually deal with big data uh, is by employing uh, hardware. So we have the chance nowadays that we have access to cheap and efficient hardware like GPUs uh, that are energy efficient and that are highly parallel. Um, and so we've discussed a lot during the conference so far the use of GPU for deep learning, for example. Uh, but we should not forget that the GPUs, uh, from the name, graphics processing units, are there also to uh, do powerful visualizations. Uh, and so about 10 years ago, the graphics pipeline from graphics card has been open to the programmers. So it used to be that you could just input your data, the graphics card would do like a fixed pipeline and then output some visualization. But parts of the visualization pipeline is now open for us to uh, customize, and so we can now make uh, some kind of domain-specific visualization by using uh, the GPU. And we can also do stuff like, uh, instead of pre-computing offline and then visualizing later, we can just load the data on the graphics card and do the processing live. Uh, so that also enables us to do uh, some rapid work and do some interactive work uh, when you do the, your analysis. Um, so the classical way to look at spectral cubes has been often to work with 2D data. Um, even though we're working with the 3D spectral cubes, the, uh, the most common way is to sort of compress it into a 2D image using statistical moments. Uh, so basically here, you, for the moment zero, you integrate uh, over the line of sight, and then you get a final image, which gives you an, an idea of the overall gas distribution. Uh, if you go to higher moments, for example, moment one, you'll get the gas velocity field that kind of shows you that your galaxy is spinning, uh, and then you can go up to higher and higher moments like this. Um, but the issue with this is that once you've computed your static image, you're stuck with it. Um, you don't have access to the raw data anymore, and if something might have been missed, uh, well, too bad, I guess. Uh, so if we look at this galaxy here, for instance, it looks like a perfectly rotating galaxy, but there's this sort of small blob uh, in the first moment, and if you only had this image, it could be difficult to know if this was an artifact from your data reduction or uh, if this is something interesting. But if you just load your data on the graphics card and then explore it, you could generate these 2D image anyways. But you have now the full power to actually explore your data, like uh, George actually uh, showed on Monday, uh, and then potentially do some interesting uh, findings. So here, for example, by just looking at the data, we found a dwarf galaxy that was never uh, found before. Um, this could have been found in other ways, but you know this is one way to do it as well. Uh, this is an extra tool that you can use. Um, and so by doing that, um, we can start exploring different ways to sort of make sense of the data a bit faster. So classically, all the 3D visualization was done with uh, one coloring technique, which was sort of mapping the voxel intensity to color. And this gives us sort of something that is very close to the zeroth moment. Uh, and so one thing that uh, we've looked at was to explore other coloring methods. So for instance, here I'm showing uh, a first moment inspired 3D visualization where you map the intensity of the voxel to the transparency and you map the color to the Z profile or the velocity. And then as you rotate, you kind of still get an idea of what you're looking at. Uh, we know that this is redshifted galaxy, for instance. And we've looked at other uh, exotic uh, coloring techniques and I'm looking forward to integrate uh, Kai's uh, self-organizing map-based uh, color actually into this. Um, and so, by actually using the GPU, we can sort of accelerate some of the bits of the pipeline like this. But this is often, uh, well, you don't always just want to look at one spectral cube or one data file. Uh, often you want to look at collections of things. And so to streamline some of the process, we can uh, sort of inspire ourselves uh, by work that is being done in the InfoVis community, uh, specifically uh, things like display ecology and visual analytics work. So a display ecology is basically creating your, a, a workspace where you have different kinds of displays to do different tasks. Uh, you want to do certain tasks on very big displays. You want to do other tasks in smaller displays. Uh, you can have personal displays or uh, collaborative uh, work where a team can chat and you know, exchange and do the, the work collaboratively. Um, and so some of the work that I've been involved in uh, was something like this, which is called uh, the NCUBE framework running on the Cave 2. Uh, at Monash University. This is sort of a, a mix between supercomputer uh, meets a very high display, uh, high-end display. Um, and so you have 80 uh, screens that are 
both 2D or 3D that you can use. You can fully immerse yourself in the, in the visualization, but you can also look at a lot of data. And not only can you look at things, but uh, you don't want to just look at things. You want to interact with your data. So what we did was to create a, a controller that allows you to uh, control the room. Um, so you have your tablet or your laptop, or this could be many tablets if you're working with a team, that then sends commands around, and then you can do things like load data, select, sort, query, and so on. And this could be based also on the results of your machine learning. So I want to look at the 20 most interesting objects that came out. You could then load all of them at once. Instead of loading one after the other on your laptop, you can just streamline your work like this. So here in this kind of room, I could load 80 cubes at once, and then have the team just walk around the room and make sense of the data. Uh, and there are, there's been work before showing that often uh, spatial movement is faster than panning and zooming on the laptop, for example. This, you can just keep on following your stream of thoughts instead of forgetting what you were work, uh, working on because things take time to load, basically. So here's an example of uh, the same framework running on the Discovery Wall at Swinburne University. Uh, and just to show what I was talking about, so here I can just control a lot of screens together using uh, the controller that is now on the, the first monitor. Uh, we hadn't had time to uh, set up the external controller yet. Um, and so now I've loaded uh, something like 20 cubes. Uh, and then you can just visualize all of them next to each other. And using the graphics shaders, we can do the coloring in real time, filtering in, re in real time, selections, and so on. And so um, we're currently exploring this with Virginia Kilborn as well at Swinburne and a team of students to uh, extend this to uh, to interesting uh, H1 work with uh, Wallaby and eventually also upper team. Um, and so this is also just a fraction of the cost of the Cave 2. The Cave 2 is like a, a million dollar Australian uh, facility while this is about $40,000. You have six computers, a few graphics cards, and uh, 12 uh, 4K monitors. Um, and this could be extended also with uh, headsets, potentially. Um, now, um, for time domain astronomy, as I was talking about, these kinds of rooms can be very helpful as well. Um, and so I've been taking part of a, a project called the Deeper, Wider, Faster Survey that uh, looks for uh, fast transients, um, or the fastest transients in the universe, at least. Uh, this is a very broad topic. I'm going to keep some details for later. But uh, anyway, so we're, we want to explore this uh, part of the parameter space that hasn't been very explored much yet, uh, from milliseconds to minutes. Um, so the, the PI for this project is Jeff Cookie at Swinburne, and uh, this is a, a very big collaboration, so there are people at Caltech involved and so on. Um, and so the idea here is to collect as much data as possible from different wavelengths at the same time. So we have about 17 telescopes uh, looking at the same patch of sky simultaneously, and then about 25 other telescopes around the globe uh, ready to follow up if anything interesting is being reported. Um, and so this involves a lot of people doing a lot of work together. Um, and so uh, here's an idea of uh, the different cameras looking at the same kind of field. You have uh, the dark energy camera in the back, uh, Subaru uh, in bright yellow, the parks beams uh, in cyan, and so on. You have the Malangolo uh, fan beam also from Australia. Anyway, so all of these telescopes can look at the same patch of sky from different wavelengths. And if anything happens, then uh, you might catch a glimpse of what happens in different wavelengths, basically. Um, and back to the data issue, um, dealing with this is non-trivial. Uh, DeckCam generates very large images. Um, so you have 60 science CCDs that are 4K by 2K. Uh, one FITS file is about 1.2 gigabyte per file. And in this kind of survey, we take an image every 40 seconds for weeks at a time. And as I was saying before, uh, most of the computation at the telescope is spent to gather the data, not to do post-processing. And so we needed to uh, transmit this data to the supercomputer at Swinburne in Australia. So we kind of estimated that uh, transferring one file from Chile at the mountaintop to Australia was taking about 17 minutes. Obviously, this changes with traffic and so on. Um, but this is too slow to do uh, you know, if you want to study very fast events. And so one thing that I've done was to introduce uh, data compression as part of the pipeline. Uh, so we used uh, the JPEG 2000 format to 
reduce the data size. Uh, we looked to make sure that we were not uh, losing any important transients. And uh, doing so uh, allowed us to go from you know, 20 minutes to often least less than a minute. Um, and by just using uh, image compression technique in this case. Um, and then once the image has reached uh, the other side, you uncompress it, you continue with your pipeline. So we have candidate identification using things like image subtraction. Uh, we flagged uh, CCD artifacts with uh, machine learning. So it was a, a random forest. And then uh, it creates a list of important candidates or things that seem to be interesting based on previous nights, for example. Uh, and then uh, if you want to trigger other telescopes, since it's all cr quite pricey, you don't want to just trigger anything. So we have a collaborative candidate uh, confirmation team that just then goes through the list of uh, candidates that is being outputted by the Mary pipeline uh, from Igor and um, then classify things as being this looks very interesting to this is not very interesting. Um, and so to do that, we've used different kind of setup. At first, we were using a room at Melbourne University like this, where you had a curved screen with projectors to look at uh, cut out of the sources where you had uh, you know, the science image, the template, and the, uh, the difference imaging. And then you had a tiled wall display where people could look at the field to make sure that it was not anything weird with the CCD, for example. Then you had a control desk where people were doing either processing or uh, organizing the work of everybody. And having this kind of room made things kind of efficient also. We could chat with our neighbors and uh, rapidly discuss things with experts if uh, we needed to, for example. Uh, most recently, uh, Swinburne has sort of established this new room to do uh, remote observing. So you have here again kind of a display ecology where you have um, you know, uh, monitors where you can interact with your data People have a lot of space to have their laptop to work together. You have communications with remote telescopes. So, for example, here there's people in Japan. Uh, you have the tile display wall that I showed earlier for the 3D visualization, but you could use that for other things as well. Um, and again, so doing that kind of work uh, allowed us to streamline some of the heavy work that we needed to do. Uh, so by using kind of different methodology, you can accelerate some of the process. Um, and something interesting about this, uh, is that not only can we uh, do the science, uh, which obviously is the end product that we need to do, uh, but we can also look at how the human are doing, uh, or humans. Um, and so Sarah Egarty at Swinburne that we can see up here, um, has made a software, so a web bra browser-based uh, software to do the candidate uh, selection. So uh, we get a live, uh, rendering of the, the candidates that are outputted by Mary, uh, like this. And so uh, each people or each person can have a live feed of different candidates uh, that are currently interesting. So you get uh, your template image, the science, and the subtraction. So for example, here we can see that something happened. Um, you have the brightness profile. You have a light curve if we have more than one data point from the previous observations. And then people were asked to uh, rate things from being either in asteroids, uh, which were uh, a lot of the cases actually, and uh, eventually we'd like to have a machine learning uh, just take these out. Uh, but again, this is kind of like a human uh, process where you want to cycle through. You don't always know what you need before you need it. So uh, we've been cycling through that uh, a few times. But anyway, so uh, and then you classify things as extremely, uh, extremely interesting to uninteresting. Um, and then we had people from different uh, backgrounds. So you have experts that absolutely know the science. So these are the core members of the project. Uh, you have intermediates that have been part of the of previous surveys, but are not necessarily experts in the field. Then you had uh, novice, which were often people interested in astronomy, but did not necessarily know a lot about astronomy. But since we needed manpower, uh, they were well welcomed. And, um, and so Sarah kind of looked at how people were doing in terms of uh, effectiveness. So was this pipeline effective to actually find interesting transients or not? Um, and so uh, she looked at the number of actions that people were taking before making a decision. So for novices, uh, we can see that even 
people that are not necessarily highly trained who are managing to make uh, decisions very quickly. Um, but they were often making a lot more actions than others. When we go to uh, the uh, intermediate, sorry, uh, bad title up there, um, they were also doing a lot more actions, but they were coming to uh, decisions uh, fairly quickly. But when we go to experts, uh, more often than not, they just knew that something was not interesting. They would not even care uh, about doing any actions. They were like, nope, that's not the, what we're looking for. Um, and then make the decisions fairly quickly. Um, and so, uh, anyways, all of this to say that by employing, uh, employing some of the techniques that we've built up throughout the years, like visualization, uh, display ecology, and so on, uh, the project has been growing by quite a margin and has been kind of successful in a sense. Uh, we're still processing all of the data that we've been uh, gathering, uh, but just in real time, for example, in 2016, uh, to just provide an, ex an example, uh, thousands of rising transients were caught uh, as they were happening, um, which provided follow-up uh, opportunity for spectroscopy. A number of transients were uh, then sent as follow-up. Uh, for example, two triggers were sent to Gemini, uh, five to SALT in South Africa, thousands to the AAT. Um, and then we've also had a, a number of uh, discoveries. So, for example, uh, we reported four possible uh, transients um, for other telescopes to follow up. And within minutes, we had a confirmation from SALT that we found a young type 1A supernovae, for example. And we had a redshift. Um, and so, uh, just to conclude, obviously, uh, working with big data uh, is non-trivial, otherwise we wouldn't be here. Um, but if we just employ a certain number of tricks, we can actually manage to uh, get through this. Um, for example, it, you know, data compression has been around since the 90s, but uh, it, it was not obvious that we could use lossy compression to do uh, science. And so, by just employing something that is a standard in many fields, uh, this is also used in medical imaging and so on, uh, but it was not necessarily clear that by losing information, you might not uh, mess up your science. Um, but, so we did check that everything was fine, it was fine, and then by introducing it, you go from working very slowly to working extremely fast. Uh, often it was too fast, actually, the data was coming too quickly for everything else to happen. Uh, so we kind of just went and uh, increased the, the quality a bit of the images. Um, and then, well, other tricks like environments also allow us to uh, streamline some of the work and also just not just accelerates the process of science, but also makes things a bit more pleasant. Like here, for example, we're all in the room and we can chat with each other. Uh, if we're all, well, for different tasks, different room might actually help. Um, sometimes I want to work by myself at my desktop, but for some other task, we want to be working together uh, so that we can efficiently do work. Um, and so by employing the right hardware or the right displays at the right time, um, we can actually uh, make our work not, more, not just more efficient, but also more pleasant. And uh, I'll keep it to this. Thank you.